Hello and welcome to Business Television India. I am Piyush Jain and joining us on the Market Guru show today is Sampad Reddy, the Chief Investment Officer at Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance. Mr. Reddy, welcome to the show. Uh, it's very interesting time actually right now. Uh, on one side again, we have been seeing uh, a lot of volatility in the global markets, but uh, lately again there has been some sort of a cool off in the volatility, some sort of calmness perhaps is returning to the markets. There has been some sort of some sort of recovery in the small caps, mid caps here. Uh, what do you make out of the current situation? What's your take uh, in terms, of if I want to look at two or three months or one or two months near term, uh, do you expect uh, this sort of volatility to persist in February and March or you think that perhaps it's, it was a matter of uh, seven days, ten days and I think uh, we are actually are looking towards a, a sort of stable market outlook here? Right. So yes, there was a quite a bit of volatility in the last uh, 10, 15 days in the markets, and you know some of it is led by the uh, global volatility, and uh, some also is due to our budget and you know the provisions of the long-term capital gains tax. Uh, I think these were all these two were the primary reasons. But you know, uh, markets have already globally markets have already corrected about five, six percent base points, and in India also, you know, most of the you know the mid caps have corrected a little bit more, but large caps in, in general have also fallen about five to ten. Uh, you know, basically, if you look at the budget provisions per se, you know, I think the uh, long-term capital gains tax, you know, 10%, you know, that was a, probably one of the main reasons why there were more, there were larger concerns in the market. But I think that, you know, that should not be a real major, uh, you know, reason for the worry in the market because that I guess will be settled very soon. 10% uh, long-term capital gains tax is not really that heavy and it will not alter the attractiveness of the equities in general. So we, you know, even with the 10% long-term capital gains tax, equity markets will continue to be attractive. That's that's one of the main reasons why we think it will be passed very soon. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, the uh, you know insurance, especially the ULIP, you know, ULIP, uh, the savings through the ULIPs is especially continues to, you know, can enjoy the same tax regime as in the past. Uh, of course, you know, ULIPs are a bit for a longer term, you know, we have a minimum five-year period of investment uh, lock-in. So that's that's you know the you know that's that's there, but you know you looks actually you know continue to enjoy the same tax regime and when investors can now you know look uh, look to participate uh, through the units as well. So you know overall, I think long term capital gains tax the impact of that is largely behind now, and you know the global volatility also seems to be now behind. Uh, so I think now onwards the markets are poised well, and uh, we think you know it's a good time to uh, you know, buy into the markets. So, Mr. Reddy, just to reiterate what you are saying, uh, so what you are saying is that perhaps uh, uh, is that because there was a word, there was a view on the street that perhaps till 31st March there will be uh, this uh, sort of a periodic selling pressure in the markets, primarily because again investors would actually like to uh, save the taxation whatever they would have they would be incurring in the next assessment year. So, what you are saying that perhaps uh, is actually that sort of selling pressure is already behind us. Uh, do you believe that sort of volatility perhaps because of the churn uh, that is not going to return uh, between now and 31st March here? Yeah, I think, you know, there is no need uh, for any incremental selling pressure, you know, uh, till 31st March, even though the uh, LTCG provisions will come in for the next, main, next financial year. That is mainly because, you know, due to the grandfathering clause which is being put in. So, you know, the prices are considered, you know, the peak of the 31st January uh, 2018 prices are considered. So, because of that, you know, you don't really need to sell before, uh, you know, the uh, 31st March. I don't think there is, uh, you know, that will lead to any incremental selling, you know, till 31st March. Right. Uh, then, actually, the next question would be, I think, for people sitting at home, I think, uh, there are a lot of moving parts here. On one side, again, uh, basically, they would be interested in knowing that uh, what's your own perception on the earnings recovery, the valuations of the market right now. Because again, we have been hearing a lot of theories. One theory, basically, or one view is that uh, perhaps again, uh, in context of the Indian market, actually the valuations are not looking that uh, inexpensive. Second part is that uh, perhaps there is an earnings recovery. The credit growth is picking up. We just heard from many banks in this uh, quarterly results. Uh, many of them actually were talking about pickup in the credit growth here. Usually, the first sign before actually the strong momentum, the earnings recovery starts to pick up here. So, from that perspective, from your own perspective on the FI19 earnings outlook, uh, what's your take on the valuation of the markets right now? 
right and also the valuations overall uh, you know slightly in the higher end of the you know long term average around 18 19 times or one year forward uh, that's a slightly higher end of the long term average you know here onwards you know we don't think the market returns will be driven by the pe expansion it is going to be actually the you know the uh, driven by the corporate earnings growth now we are very hopeful that you know fi 19 and 20 as well you know the corporate earnings growth will be very good even if the pe is going to contract you know investors would still make a good amount of money because as we believe the next two years earnings growth will be in the closer to that 20% cagr even if the pe is going to contract a little bit you know about you know 1 to 15% earning uh, uh, return in the next two years is you know is what we think will be is achieved in the market uh in terms of yes you know growth uh, uh, you know proper credit growth is picking up and uh, especially the you know the private uh, private sector banks we like them a lot you know they have the growth potential is very very good you know they they continue to take market share away from the public sector banks and you know at the uh, you know because of that the growth in that uh, segment will continue to be very good uh, also uh we like the export oriented uh, you know the uh, companies or sectors you know especially if you look at the us geography things are improving there uh you know the growth is likely to come back there you know with the the tax recent tax reforms there corporate tax rate is coming has come down dramatically and all of that will lead to the you know overall uh, growth in the you know us us geography especially you know also the recent uh, announcement regarding the you know infrastructure spend all of that i think will lead to the good growth in the us geography and you know overall com- uh, companies which are exposed to the uh, us exports will also do well right again so basically we got two pointers here one is private banks and also the export oriented uh, companies or the sectors again which have very high export linkage here so uh, from that perspective and, and if i want to link this point to to the point which uh, you were making that perhaps the corporate earnings growth again actually is looking much better here so which are the the sectors or basically the themes you would be actually increasing your uh, either uh, stance uh, to overweight or basically more capital allocation so one side you talked about private banks here but when you talk about export oriented stocks here uh, is it also about the auto ancillaries uh, auto stocks or is it about the it stocks or is it about the textile stocks again which actually have very large uh, uh, exposure to the us markets or a part of global supply chain here uh, like which are the the small themes again which uh, you would be focusing on yeah in the uh, you know i mean of course in addition to the private uh, banks you know what we like in the export is basically it services companies you know their uh, uh, the you know the valuation continues to be very very attractive and cash flows and return ratios of these companies are very good but they generally you know they you have very good high quality company uh, companies where you can invest so it sector is certainly we like that and you know a lot of this growth in the us geography is going to be driven by the uh, you know the infrastructure or corporate spending there you know i mean that the, you know, so it is that's why we probably may not be you know the you know uh, looking at you know uh, con- consum- consum- consumption uh, sectors like uh, textiles but it will be largely you know exporters to the industrial segment you know which is basically for exporters to the corporate you know, which is basically uh, it services Uh, and also uh, you know with the overall infrastructure spend and infrastructure you know boost in the us geography we could see the you know the metals could also be one of the beneficiaries overall uh, you know not only the in uh, the infrastructure spend in the us but also in china which is one of the largest producers globally uh, which account for almost 50% of all you know key commodities uh, in production so there also there is a lot of uh, you know discipline uh, coming through and you know there have been cut back in terms of production because of environmental led initiatives you know all of these both these two things you know is leading to the overall better uh, commodity prices you know the commodity sector especially aluminum and steel sector you know where india has got a huge competitive advantage you know these two sectors also would do well so we like metals also as a sector uh coming to the auto ancillaries yes auto ancillaries also we like you know within the auto space you know we like our uh, ancillaries better you know auto oems you know there's still a small amount of uh, fear regarding the disruption uh, you know to the evs so it's better to play through some of the you know uh, ancillaries you know that i think you know is a sector we like there right uh, so we talked about it services metals auto ancillaries uh, let me pick out the metals first again because we have been seeing some sort of pick up in the metal prices also here uh, what's your take right now mr reddy on the metal stocks valuations here i'm not asking about individual stocks because i know uh, there would be a uh, compliance uh, uh, basically uh, issues there 
But then in terms of uh, the metal stocks, the valuations right now, on one side the prices remain elevated. Uh, they actually are holding out uh, to their current levels here. But overall on the valuations right now, uh, what do you think? How much of growth is already priced in the price uh, right now? And uh, secondly again, in terms of the global earnings recovery or global uh, growth recovery, uh, what's the overall take on the, the pricing here? Yes, the metal stocks have moved up uh, somewhat in the last one, one and a half years. But I think, you know, whenever uh, the uh, sector turns around and the commodity prices were to go up, the amount of cash flow these companies generate will be very, very significant. You know, there will be a dual play. You know, one is obviously, you know, there is a high amount of debt sitting on these most of the metal companies. Uh, you know, with the uh, significant profits coming through in the next one, two years, you know, the debt reduction will also take place. Now, that will also add to the, you know, faster earnings growth. I think, you know, the whatever the growth that we have seen in the share prices, you know, still uh, you know, a lot to go, you know, especially uh, even if the even if the commodity prices were to just remain where they are, you know, they need not go up further for the stocks to rise. Even if the, you know, steel, aluminum and zinc and copper prices were to remain where they are today for the next one year, two years, I think these stocks will continue to generate 15, 20 percent CAGR for the next two years easily. Right. And within this, again, do you have any sort of preference or uh, more sort of overweight, overweight stance on any particular sub-segment in the metal sector, for example, uh, steel or maybe uh, companies with more exposure to zinc or more exposure to copper. I'm just asking primarily because the pricing trends are different, uh, sort of uh, competitive advantage is very different. Any particular preference for a sub-theme more? Yeah, in the, we generally like the steel sector a bit better, uh, you know, mainly, you know, the operating leverage is very, very strong there and, uh, uh, you know, so the financial leverage is very good. You know, most of the companies are highly, you know, uh, are deeply, uh, you know, geared. Uh, so steel sector is, you know, we like it better and followed by, you know, aluminum sector because these two are the sectors where, you know, India has a natural, uh, India has a competitive advantage you know, because of, uh, you know, access to the, very high quality natural resource. You know, I mean, others like, for example, copper. You know, we really don't have any advantage there. Or uh, maybe zinc also. You know, we have a. You know, uh, you know, we have only one company there, and also backed by very, uh, very good. Uh, you know, the uh, captive ore. So the, these are the two places where we like. Uh, you know, these are the two commodities we like better. Right. So again, that's actually the word on the metals here. Uh, steel again basically is uh, forming the preferred area for Mr. Reddy here. Now, the next question is actually, I want to talk about auto also, but let me actually ask you first on the IT here. Uh, almost actually uh, all the stocks, uh, first again started with the mid cap IT, then we saw with the large cap IT. It was a surprise because again almost uh, four months back, again a lot of word on the street was that actually the operating environment is very tough. And now actually we are talking about that uh, Suddenly, the things have turned here. So, Mr. Reddy, what's your stance on the IT sector right now? Is it underweight, overweight, equal weight? And uh, secondly, because you have highlighted that perhaps outperformance would come from this sector, uh, what's the reason for that? And number two, uh, are you overweight on mid cap IT or large cap IT? Uh, in the IT, actually, you know, we prefer to be in the larger cap name because they're more liquid, uh, you know, and you know, uh, and uh, and also the valuation difference between mid cap and large cap is not really uh, any any significant difference. So that's why you know we've relatively been liking the large cap names, you know, the top four five companies, you know, they are very liquid, and also the PE multiples are also you know, uh, you know, I would say you know, in, in fact, you know, slightly lower than that of even the mid cap companies. And mid cap companies, is, you know, I mean, uh, the amount of diligence required is quite high. You know, by and large, the, the client concentration risk is there in almost all the, you know, the mid cap companies. You know, uh, if any client were to have a trouble, you know, then there will be an impact there. So it is, you know, better to you know, stick to the larger cap companies, which are top four five companies in IT space, and their valuations are also attractive. And you know they are very well diversified. There is no single client concentration risk or a single sector concentration risk there. So I think you know the larger cap IT companies we prefer. But you know there's you know as a sector you know we are likely to do well. So you know both be it the large cap as well as mid cap, the valuation multiples are you know a lot more attractive. Uh, you know as you have seen that you know in the last uh, last one one and a half year you know by and large most almost every company in that space you know uh, paid back the excess cash through the dividends or through the buybacks. So there's a huge amount of cash generation happening there. I think uh, the sector will do well. So we like to be overweight on this IT services sector. Yes. Uh, so as you're just saying that uh, basically you are overweight on IT services sector right now. 
but just before I actually want to ask you more on the mid-cap IT, uh, uh, what's the difference between the stance which you had, uh, which you had uh, six, six months back and uh, now, uh, was it actually equal weight or underweight, was there a change in stance or you were anyways actually overweight on IT services here? We've been generally liking this sector for almost uh, more than six months and uh, we continue to, you know, uh, have an overweight since then. Uh, so there is no major uh, 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 change in, in terms of weight uh, in the IT service sector. It's largely because of, you know, I mean, uh, appreciation of the you know, relative sectors, etc. could have changed. But otherwise, you know, I mean, we continue to be liking this. We've been liking this sector for quite some time and, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the stance remains same even just today. Uh, so just one question, Mr. Reddy, because if I'm just looking at the metrics here, I'm not taking uh, the views on the stocks, but I'm actually questioning uh, the mid-cap versus large-cap here theory uh, for our viewers primarily, is that KPID trading around 19 times, Infosys trading around 15 times, TCS trading around 22 times, trailing P here. Uh, uh, so the mid-cap IT basically also actually offers higher growth opportunity here. Uh, a uh, lot of stocks again would be growing anywhere between uh, 15, 20 to 30 percent here in terms of your earnings. So while you're just saying that yes, client concentration perhaps is actually an issue, uh, operating in a very niche area is also an issue, uh, but also earnings growth again basically is of a much higher trajectory here. So what's your take on that? Uh, again, because the valuation difference is also uh, not much here, but earnings right. growth is much higher. Somehow that has been the trend uh, in the valuations for the last uh, almost about couple of years. Uh, by and large, you know, mid-cap companies have been trading at a higher PE multiple than that of the large-cap companies, not just in IT, but even otherwise. Even today, if you look at the Nifty PE versus, you know, any of the mid-cap uh, indices PE, you now the mid-cap indices are trading at a much higher level. Now, that has been the trend. Maybe, you know, investors are positioning for the, uh, you know, the imi uh, imminent corporate earnings recovery. If earnings were to grow, probably mid-cap companies will grow faster in earnings. But I think, you know, even the uh, even this, you know, strong recovery in earnings growth and an expected faster growth in the mid-cap companies are also, you know, uh, indicating uh, you know, are also priced in higher valuations. So, Relatively, the risk reward is, I think, you know, more in favor of the larger cap companies, not just in IT services, but even otherwise in the in the broader market as well. So we like relatively uh, more of a larger cap company where there the risk reward is a lot better. Okay, so larger cap uh, IT companies again, those are preferred uh, because the risk reward ratio again is favorable, and also we have seen. Uh, over the last almost two or three weeks here, again, that basically large cap IT stocks, again, they are catching up with the mid cap IT companies here. Uh, coming to the third part you just talked about is uh, the auto ancillaries also. Uh, now, these actually are very large exporters. Uh, they also have very large stake in the European growth, in the U.S. growth markets. At present, uh, where you basically are positioning yourselves, companies which actually are catering more to the U.S. markets, or companies which are catering more to the European markets. I'm, I'm trying to find a niche uh, within the sector. You know, this, I mean, unlike you know, IT services, they are not as uh, highly exposed to the uh, you know the either of the any uh, markets you mentioned. Uh, you know, whether it is European region or US region. By and large, most auto ancillary companies have significant proportion of their revenues coming from the domestic market, and also you know they diversified into the exports as well. So there, here, you know, the uh, growth opportunity is, you know, we have to look between the, uh, you know, the uh, expected change in the, through the electric vehicle. You know, some of the sectors, some of the, some of the suppliers in the uh, auto ancillaries could be, you know, disrupted uh, quite badly if electric vehicles were to, you know, be highly successful. Yeah. So that, you know, it's, it's, it's very important to, you know, the play through the, you know, right technology and, you know, uh, you know right uh, product mix uh, in terms of the, how to answer this. Probably, for example, you know, the tires as a sector, you know, I mean, that's really, you know, I mean, uh, not going to be disrupted by the uh, EVs per se. You know, you've got to look at some of the companies, you know, where the technology risk uh, uh, is, is is not likely to be there. I think that's what, you know, we have to want us to focus. Right? In one of the, for example, what we mentioned is, you know, tires as a segment, segment, you know, we are pretty fine. Let's say batteries as a company, you know, as an utility, you know, we don't know uh, how it, uh, how the, uh, you know, uh, how it would look like, you know, three to five years down the line if electric vehicles were to be highly successful. You know, how, how, you know, how will this company's business model get disrupted? One doesn't know. So that's why, you know, for a longer term perspective, uh, we are focusing more on companies where, you know, the EV disruption is unlikely to get impacted. You know, so those are the segments we are focusing on. 
Right. So again, basically, an eye on uh, the technology and the the way transition is happening within the auto ancillary companies also. Uh, but then also, I also want to ask you on the other side of the spectrum here, like which are the sectors which actually you have an underweight stance, or perhaps you believe that these sectors actually are going to underperform in terms of the earnings growth, in terms of participating in the earnings recovery here. Uh, you know the uh, you know there will be whole host of you know the uh, smaller segments you know, could be some small type segment but you know what are the other th things which we would like to you know closely watch uh, and you know, uh, you know look to add at an appropriate time is the pharmaceutical sector I think uh, that sector has been uh, uh, you know uh, taken a significant beating in the last one two years mainly driven by the US FDA regulatory issues uh, you know the valuations have not yet come to the you know, very attractive level in spite of these issues, but I think you know either if the valuations come down a little bit more, or if the US FDA should get uh, you know get uh, resolved, I think that sector will begin to do well. Maybe I think you know it's about five to six months away from the sector. Uh, that that segment, that sector, we will actively you know we keenly watch at that one and then look to you know take a, you know increase the position of as appropriately. Uh, maybe uh, you know the telecom continues to be in really you know in a difficult situation. That is a segment where you know one need to keep continuously be watching you know how the how and when the pricing uh, price uh, you know, the price war or market share tussle gets settled. You know since uh, you know, uh, one has to keep watching for that and even when that you know is closer to the uh, vicinity, you know one could look to you know build an exposure to the telecom sector. But today you know we're not really uh, heavily exposed to that sector. Like that, you know, all other sectors, you know, where we don't have an you know, extremely positive view, but, you know, doesn't mean that they are, you know, they are, you know, they are not uh, an investment, uh, investable sector. It's just that, you know, maybe today's, you know, dynamics, today's valuations, you know, uh, may not be appropriate. So we're keenly watching that space and, you know, uh, when, what is the right time to get into or, or, you know, or what are the dynamics that are changing. So we need to watch for those things and you know try to uh, get into them as and when appropriate. So, Mr. Reddy, a word. Do you believe that perhaps pharma could also be dark horse in this year? Because again, there are two parts here. One is the valuation, the PE multiples are actually are, are trading at very uh, low sort of valuations compared to very much they have been in the last five or six years. So, one is opportunity of a re-rating in terms of PE valuations here, and number two again basically of the earnings recovery here. Uh, if if and if, uh, if the U.S. price erosion, it starts seeing some bottom or some stabilization. But what do you think, basically, how much far we are from that place, or perhaps uh, some signs of recovery you are seeing right now? Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, not yet, but I think you know, maybe you know, that's what I said. Like, you know, we can keenly watch, you know, the, the space. There are, you know, the several uh, U.S. FDA plant inspection scheduled in the next couple of months, and uh, how it goes, you have to see that. And uh, you know, probably I think you know, maybe uh, based on the either the you know share price correction or you know some of these positive news flows on the regulatory aspect, you know, any of these things get materialized, you know, that's when one should uh, you know look to get into the stocks, uh, get into the sector in a significant way. Right, uh, and I also want to ask you like about some of the small themes again, which have been doing re uh, relatively very well. Uh, in the last four or five months, they may be very small part of uh, the market cap. Uh, but again, if uh, you like any of them, if actually you have been allocating capital to them, so again, themes like uh, paper again, uh, themes like uh, chemicals, uh, typically uh, companies which have exposure to the industrial chemicals here, and uh, uh, some other like uh, the small themes uh, like uh, could be like uh, again companies which have uh, different exposure. Uh, with respect to the, the Asian sort of consumption here or maybe small consumer durables again because we are uh, again basically moving towards a sort of recovery in the, the durable consumption also. So do you like any of those themes? Yes, I think you know there are some, uh, you know all of these spaces where you mentioned there will be you know one or two good quality companies you know we do have an exposure to you know for example let's say air conditioning as a segment you know companies in that space we've been liking that uh, sector for last several years and you know uh, you know done the sector has done done really very well so and also the potential continues to be good you know the growth opportunity in the you know air conditioning or some of the consumer uh, durable space you know is really good so we like some of the companies there. Uh, and also the uh, the uh, paper we have not really you know looked at in detail, but you know the you know other segments uh, you know in chemicals and paints you know yes there are some good quality companies where the you know, growth turnaround is happening. 
uh, and that space also, you know, we have some investments, uh, both chemicals as well as paints. No, there are, it's all, the, 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 all of these, you know, the small sectors where you mentioned, you know, it's all a lot more uh, driven by the bottom-up, uh, you know, stock selection approach. Uh, yes, they, this, these two segments certainly offer some of the good, attractive investments. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Reddy, for all the insights and into uh, where actually our viewers actually should be expecting in terms of your overweight stance and perhaps the outperformance in the markets here. So that's the word coming from Bajaj Alliance, Mr. Reddy. And uh, to summarize it, again, the private banks, uh, the sectors, again, which have export linkage uh, to the U.S. markets so or primarily have export linkage, again, those should be outperforming here. Uh, we discussed three primary themes here in terms of the export linkage here. IT services, number two metals, and also number three auto ancillaries again are the three areas where again Mr. Reddy was sounding optimistic in terms of they could be outperforming uh, the way again earnings recovery could be shaping up and for this year again earnings expectation as such here. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Market Guru from the entire team here. Thanks a lot for watching us.